need. So I'm going to go ahead and hit record and I'm going to turn it over to Steve and Stefan. Guys, thank you so much for putting this together. I look, I'm excited for a great webinar. Awesome. Well, I am going to go ahead and start. Uh, see, there, I just blew the game. I just blew the game. I blew, blew the game. I blew the game. I blew the game. All right. Well, you're going to hear quite a bit from Steve and I. Fail fast, fail loud. And that was an unfortunate fail that we had our game going and I just blew it. We're going to make you guess which one of us was, was running, running the thing here. See how seamless we really were. So, like, like Jeff said, we have been lockstep steve and i it's thursdays with steve and stefan or stefan and steve whichever you prefer and we've just been presenting together non-stop straight through since 7 30 a.m believe that that's what happened that's what's happening but right now we are super super excited to bring to you some talk about blended learning so we are calling this webinar blended learning learning with and without walls and steve I'm going to put you on the spot here real quick. Would you mind giving us the background of where that name came from? Absolutely. You know, talking with my wife, to be honest with you, she's an instructional designer and I was just putting some ideas out there. Stefan and I knew we were going to do this webinar. We had significant passion about this, trying to come up with a name that would work. And we just had a conversation and she basically said, Hey, just tell me a couple of things about it. And the first thing that we came up with or that she came up with, this is why you collaborate with your, your spouses and the people in your buildings, right? Was learning with or without walls. And then we started talking about it and we went, hold on a second. There's something that's minor there that we need to change because it's not an or. It's not with or without walls. It's and. It's both. It's something that we're going to put in place that works for both. So we made that little change to learning with and without walls. And I love it because I think it very much re represents what we're going to present to you today. Yeah, and we honestly are hoping, hoping it's not one of our instructional goals here, but like if you leave this webinar understanding the difference between and and or in that title, then we probably, that's a pretty good measure of us doing our job. But before we jump into that, we're going to give you just a brief introduction because some of you know who we are. Some of you are, let's say, lucky enough to have Steve and I, right? I was in a cohort the other day where he said, don't tell anybody, but this is the best duo you got, right? And now we've told everybody. So, told everybody. <laughs> uh, so some of you are from our cohorts and we've been pitching that all afternoon, but we are excited. So in case you don't get to see us on a weekly or bi-weekly basis here, my name is Stefan Troutman. I currently work in the Moses Lake School District. I work there as an instructional technology coach, specifically at the high school there. So it's the one high school. So you could categorize me as a 9-12 instructional technology coach. I'm liking that term less and less because it's just about good teaching. And hopefully that's something you walk away with today that we're talking about good instructional strategies. And that's really what that's, that's morphed into. But before that, I was teaching for six years in uh, seventh grade, seventh grade English. And I did, I threw that SEL portion in there, social emotional learning, because that's actually going to be super relevant to what we're talking about today. So I spent uh, six years working as a seventh grade ELA teacher and doing some leadership work with students, some servant leadership, and that was fantastic. And then I had the opportunity to jump up to that high school level and work with teachers. And so I've been doing that for the last two years. And I just big shout out to Moses Lake High School because I've been thinking a lot recently about this whole remote learning experience. And last year was their first year going one-to-one -one, and they made a ton of growth and teachers are not great at recognizing that growth because we always focus on things that we need to fix. But if we take a step back and we breathe and we see that huge growth, I just keep thinking, what if remote learning had happened to us last year? But this year they've just been killing it. And that's been super fun to just dig my hands in with those teachers and, and do that remote learning work and start to have these types of conversations. So before that, I grew up in Colorado, uh, not born there, but raised there in uh, Arvada. I like to call it little, but it's definitely not right there in the middle of Boulder and Denver. So if you have any Colorado connections, let me know. There's always one. There's always someone's like, oh, I've got a friend in Arvada. And last, last webinar, actually, one of the presenters was living in Arvada, Colorado. Weird connection. And then I graduated from high school there and attended Whitworth University in Spokane and loved it. Fantastic school, prepared me greatly. And I, that has brought me here. So 
If there is one thing that I want you walking away from this webinar with, I'm just going to steal blatantly from Jeff, so I hope he doesn't mind. It's this idea of highly structured and loosely organized, a highly structured and loosely organized classroom. And I'm not going to go too deeply into that, but I do just want you thinking about structure, structure, structure as, as we dig in. So that being said, I'm going to turn this over to Steve. Who are you, man? <laughs> Hey, everybody. I'm Steve Murphy, and I'm coming to you from beautiful Enumclaw, Washington, here on the west side of the mountains. And it's a beautiful day today, and I see that there's a few of us from Enumclaw in the chat. So right on, go Enumclaw. And I even saw Jody Maris in there, a former colleague. So hi, Jody. Good to see you, um, seeing that the, come up in the chat there. I've been teaching for 22 years. I've been coaching for 24 years. Uh, I'm currently going to be this next year going to be our technology TOSA in the last five, six years when we did our one-to-one -one Chromebook rollout. I've been an instructional technology leader just from the classroom. So I'm a classroom teacher okay, that's moving into a TOSA type teaching position when it comes to technology in our district, but very, very passionate about this move to kind of blended learning and uh, improving our teaching practices. Real quickly, just something about me is I attended the University of Washington and I had the opportunity to play baseball there. I know we got people coming from all over the state and I know that Jeff's standing there. So I'll say just for Jeff, go dogs. Okay, go dogs to all the Cougs out there. Okay, I know that that's either probably going to divide us in some way, shape, or form, but you know, hey, that's, that's how it goes. Like Stefan talked about, highly structured, loosely organized. And I'm glad he got a chance to say it first because I tend to get them backwards at times. But it's very, very important to me in my classroom to be able to have that highly structured, loosely organized approach to what we're doing. But I will add this. If you're going to be moving your direct, moving in this direction, which we believe is the best direction for students and for education and for learning, it's significantly important that you also take on the mantra that we are also stealing from Jeff, but we've re really, really embraced it, Reimagine Washington Ed, and that is to fail fast and fail loud. It's okay to not have everything work perfectly right at the beginning. It, you will learn from it, you'll improve upon it, and it'll make your practices that much better. So we've had plenty of fail fast, fail loud moments that have gotten us to this point. And I promise you, and I hope that I have many more because it means I'm continuing to try new things. And so that's what we're going to hopefully also instill in you is the idea that it's okay to take some risks and for, not to be, to, for it not necessarily to work perfectly. So what we want to discuss today and what we hope to present to you okay, and why we're here is this idea of hoping that you can gain some significant learning and understanding about blended learning and have a better, clearer understanding of what that might be. So really two objectives that are all entailed in that one that you see on your screen there, and that is number one, that you can leave this webinar with an understanding of the power of blended learning, the power for you in the classroom, but more importantly, the power for learning and ownership of that learning for your students. And then number two, that you leave with some understanding of some tools and some clear strategies that will help implement or help with the implementation of blended learning in your classroom to make it more manageable. So you'll notice, well, I'll get to that in just a second. So we talk about the why, okay? We talk about the why that we're here as we wanna discuss those, as discuss clearly four advantages of blended learning and be able to identify what those are. We also wanna talk about the what part of things. And when we talk about what, we're gonna be defining blended learning for you, what it is, what it isn't, and being able to look at uh, and what it looks like in a blended learning classroom. And then finally, the how. Okay, so be able to make, put some things in place that will allow it to be manageable for you. Okay, some, some strategies, some, some tips that will allow and review four steps specifically, okay, that will allow you to make this learning manageable. And before we move to the next slide, and before I turn it over to Stefan to dig into why are we looking at blended learning in the classroom, I wanna just point out a couple of things to you on this slide. There are some wayfinding pieces that will allow you to understand what's coming up and what's being presented to you. So you have a symbol of the light bulb next to the why, the, the magnifying glass next to the what, and then the, the, the settings wheel that's next to the how. So anytime you see those throughout our presentation, that's what we're gonna be discussing and that's what we're gonna be talking about. So we're gonna start with the why, and talking about the advantages of blended learning in the classroom. And this, th this, as we started to get going, Steve and I are super passionate about this. And we have just met briefly in, in like the physical realm here, but most of our time together has been digitally through Reimagine Y Ed. But we we've known as we as we prepared this, we have 
just both been very passionate about blended learning. And so Steve is taking a professional risk here in allowing me to take over the why of blended learning because the first thing we said to each other was, we're going to need to be okay with cutting each other off, right? If one of us, oh, see, see, that's what I'm talking about. We said that yesterday. Uh, I'm looking at the time that I have allotted for this slide, and I just wanted to let you know that I might just go a little nuts because if I get to talk about the why blended learning, then that's like a playground for me. So why would we use a blended learning model in the classroom before remote learning or after doesn't matter really what it is it's all about good teaching so we are hoping that you get to walk away from this webinar today with some good teaching strategies and know that we are lifelong learners and if i could tell you that you could work in an environment where 100% of your time was spent on higher level thinking, was spent on constant differentiation for your students to meet every single student where they needed to be, to work in small groups and not do whole group instruction, but do some whole group dis discussion type things to really get your t kids to dig into the, the, the content and the essential learnings, you'd probably jump at that chance. And that's exactly what we're talking about. And when I first heard about that, I just went ballistic. And I remember saying, I didn't know you could teach like that. So there's a few things that we want to outline for you as we go through here. It's just some things that we think about when we talk about why we would move to a blended learning classroom. So we just have four of, you, four of them in front of you here. And that first one is going to be agency and control. When in our classrooms do our students have control over their learning? So often school is done to them right? They don't get to choose what they're studying, where or when they're consuming the information. And that's one of those things that teachers are starting to take away from this remote learning environment is turning over that sense of agency and control in a learning environment. And then personalization. I often operate under this a third, a third, a third, right? A third aren't getting it, a third are, and a third don't need it, right? And when we do whole group instruction, that's typically what's happening in our classrooms. But if we can personalize our lessons and we can do some, some form of instruction that is differentiated for each kid where they need it, that's the dream, right? That is the dream. And oftentimes we think, well, within the, the constructs of our typical classroom, we can't do that. That's where blended learning comes in. We're also talking about future ready skills. I, I heard a teacher in one of our cohorts just this past week say they didn't want their students to become robots, right? They felt like that in their classroom, their kids were just kind of working on an assembly line. And so they decided to rethink some things. And sometimes these are, are 21st century skills. Sometimes these are post-secondary skills. We're calling them future ready skills because we don't know what the future is going to hold for our kids, but there are a certain amount of things, there, there, are, there are concepts that we can tell teachers and every teacher will say, I want a kid to leave my class with that skill, being a good critical thinker, to being a, a, a rational thinker or a researcher, right? So there are some things that we can build into a blended learning environment, like an authentic audience with and without walls. Steve's going to talk a little bit about that later today or this evening, about how we can bring in an authentic audience into our classroom and connect students like they've never been connected to before to give them access to resources that we can't in our classroom. Oh my goodness. Steve said at the beginning, fail fast, fail loud, right? If we were hold account, held accountable for everything we did and then screwed up, then none of us would be in our profession right now. But sometimes that's the way that works in our classrooms, right? And students, we just had this conversation yesterday in, can't remember the cohort number, but they were saying, my kids are afraid to take risks. They're afraid of failure. And those are the kids that need us to model risk taking and say, oops, I screwed up, but it's okay because I am in a supported environment to take that to the next level. So we can build in opportunities for creativity and risk taking and build a culture or an environment where failure isn't just allowed, it's expected. It's built into the process. So when I ask you, when are our students expected to fail? I'm not talking about a grade. I'm talking about learning. Right? So when can we make our students fail? Because we know that's when we learn the most. And then finally, we're thinking on a systems-wide level, uniting culture and language within our, within our buildings, having staff connect to each other, and the simplification of language and systems within our buildings is just what's good for kids. And as we're thinking about a blended learning classroom, I really want us moving forward with this idea that kids don't care what they're learning, they care why they're learning it. 
there's not a teacher out there who hasn't gotten the question, when am I ever going to use this? Right. And to me, in my classroom, when I was asked that question, and it took me some time to get there, don't get me wrong, right? I, whatever. When I get that question, that was a reflection to me that this kid doesn't understand the purpose of their learning. And there's something that I can do to fix that. And sometimes that is a reimagining of our system within our classroom walls. Steve, how'd I do on time, man? You're doing awesome. I'm the best. Uh, any thoughts on why we would move to a blended learning environment that I did not cover? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I think one of the things that I would add and in the notes that I have, and I know something that I see all the time, and I'm sure all of you out there have experienced as well, is it, this is difficult. It's a difficult switch, not just for you, but at times it can be a difficult switch for the students because many of them have what I would describe as learned how to play the game of school. They've learned how to play school. And that, that, that is something that's very different than what the blended learning classroom is. But the reason that the shift is so significantly important when we talk about in the next slide here coming up on what is a blended learning classroom, in case you're still trying to wrap your mind around that, it really is important to be future ready and in future ready skills okay, to be able to push them out of that comfort zone, to not do, do just what's easiest because that's what they've always done. It doesn't necessarily mean it's what's in their best interest. So I think taking those risks to be able to the necessity of pushing them out of that comfort zone so that they don't just play school like they've been taught. And so that becomes a challenge, especially at the secondary level. So here's, and I remember what happened when we said, hey, tell us where you're coming from and the chat exploded. And so I'm excited to see what's about to happen here and how we're gonna keep up with that, Steve. But here's the deal, as we were thinking about, cause Steve's about to take us into what is blended learning? We're gonna define the blended learning environment here and talk about that a little bit because I mean, all of these things about giving control to a student and getting them to experience future ready skills in a blended learning environment and not just teach them how to be advocates for themselves, but to make them be advocates for ourselves. Those are the things we want our kids leaving our classroom with, right? And so Steve's going to take us through a little bit of what it is and what it isn't. I'm going to discuss that a little bit. But there's some questions coming through in the chat, which it's like you're looking at our presentation. What we want is for you to tell us what are some of your concerns and apprehensions regarding implementation of a blended learning environment, right? So when I say these things about kids are online and they're offline and they're working at their own pace and they have control and our, and our content is personalized, we know there are some alarm bells that go off in teachers' heads, right? But what about, but what about, but what about? We want your but what abouts in the chat right now. So take a second, think, Take some time to think first and write down on a piece of paper, right? List all of the things, all of those apprehensions that you have about implementing a blended learning environment and then put those in the chat so we can take a look at them, please. And as you're adding those to the chat, I wanna to continue to point you in the direction of the consistency of how we present information in the blended learning classroom. And again, we'll get to what that means exactly here in just a second, but you'll notice on this slide, upper left-hand corner is our Y and our graphic that is connected with that and our image that's connected there. In the lower right-hand corner are our chat bubbles. So as you see this come, out, come up throughout the rest of our presentation, if you see a slide pop up, in your mind, be thinking, all right, I better be paying attention and engaged here because I'm going to be asked to do something and add something to the chat okay, at the conclusion of that particular presentation portion of that slide. And I'm not sure if you're taking a look at the, the chat. And I just did this really dumb thing where I was like, oh, they're not, things aren't coming in super quickly as I'm scrolling through the chat. I realized down below there's this constantly ticking number of 32 unread messages. Oh. <laughs> so things are coming in at a, at a pace. I'm seeing some great questions. And this is what teachers do best, right? They focus on what's best for kids. So uh, this is awesome. I'm just going to scroll through these things here a little bit. And then Steve, you're the one with the timer. You tell me when you're, yep, when you think we're good. We we're good. Let's go on. Let's, let's move on. Party. And then go I, for but it. I'm going to ask Jeff in kind of the moderating role there is as we get towards the end of this, maybe we can address a few of those questions rather than just wait till the end or anything that we could do in that particular spot. So here's what I want to say about what is blended learning. I know in doing this presentation yesterday when we did a run through with it and talking to a few other teachers, there's still, and I remember being in this position about you know, four or five years ago, and I feel like I'm still learning a lot about blended learning, but it's teachers that are saying, okay, I hear this all the time, but I can't really wrap my mind around what exactly it is. And so I wanna make sure that we are avoiding the temptation 
to delineate online instruction versus in-class instruction, right? We're not talking about online and offline as being two separate things. Really what blended learning is exactly what it sounds like, and it's taking those two things and blending them together in a way that is best for students as we move forward in our educational model, whatever that might look like. So this blended learning classroom is not something just for right now when we're in emergency distance learning. It's not something for just online. It is something that absolutely can be done in the classroom. I've been doing it for the last five or six years in my classroom, or at least attempting to and trying to put it in place. It's not, and I repeat, it's not simply putting your in-class content online though. There are some structural things that need to happen with it. It's not just taking a worksheet and putting it onto your online portion of things. That's not blended learning. Okay? This should be something that's new, improved model for learning. And so if we look at a you know, definition that we have in Reimagine Washington Ed for blended learning, I'm just gonna kind of paraphrase for you here, but it's really about using the right tool for the right job okay, that is both online and offline. Something that can be done in the classroom, something that can be done out of the classroom, within the walls, and outside the walls, okay? It's the practice of combining those types of things, digital and analog. So we're not saying in a blended learning environment that that means you do everything on a Chromebook, you do everything on a computer, okay? There are times that you might say on the day, hey, today we're putting that away and we're doing something a little bit different because we're doing in-class discussion and conversation. We're blending the best of both worlds together. And we're putting and turning over that control, like Stefan said, of student agency to the students, okay? We're turning over the, the locus of control and what they're going to be in the direction, pace, and path that they're going to be doing over to the students. And really that's about creating authentic learning experiences for our students and student agency and building student agency. So what is blended learning? It's face-to-face -face combined with e-learning. It's not simply e-learning alone. It's also, okay, blended learning is a personal and interactive experience for students. And quite frankly, it is for teachers as well. It's more of an interactive piece that is naturally going to happen. It is definitely not robotic and rigid. It's very much loose and free flowing, which for speaking from, especially people in the chat that know me from Enumclaw, here's the type A guy that likes to be in control of everything. So even for me, it's freeing to be able to allow me to be able to talk with my students and go through things that way that has been much better for me um, and my own health in, in working with them. But for students especially, it's much more personal and interactive. It's also a system that can create much more equity. So when we talk about creating equity and learning for students, as opposed to what it is not, is limiting learning opportunities. We have found, I have found, that some of my students that did not thrive very well in a traditional brick and mortar classroom have been thriving in this model. There's some that have not, but if that's the case, then the brick and mortar circumstance was meeting the needs of some students, whereas this model is more meeting the needs of some other students. So if that's the case, it's best for us to blend them together and be able to allow that to give a great opportunity of equity for students to be able to, to learn. And before we get to maybe some of the items in the chat, I'll just finish with this. And I've, I've really gone through in my, in my practice, in my professional development from when I started and starting really, really simply, which is what we're going to give you later, a few strategies to be able to do that. I've really started to ask myself two questions, number, or I guess multiple questions, but two different ways of asking those different questions. Number one, whenever I'm putting something together in a learning opportunity for my students, I'm asking myself, could this be done both within my walls and outside my walls? And if I can answer yes to that, then it's fitting my new blended learning type of circumstance. So the traditional worksheet became almost like, it felt like it was 50 years ago for me. All of a sudden, I had to shift different directions because that was not one that could be done outside the classroom, at least with me helping and me able to be engaged and involved. So it really has changed the lens for me when I put together a learning opportunity to ask that question. Can I do this within my walls and can I do this outside my walls? And then another decision-making filter when it comes to new tech tools, when it comes to different types of models, there's four questions that I would love for us to be able to kind of process. Number one, is this in the best interest of our students and our kids? And this blended learning opportunity of choice is definitely in the best learning, the best, best interest of learning for our kids. Is it in the best interest of staff? Is it in the best interest uh, as for, for teachers and staff? I would say yes. Now, early on, you might go, man, this is gonna be a little bit more work for me and it's a little bit hard, but long-term for me, this has given me more ownership in being able to interact with my students, giving them more ownership. It's made things more enjoyable and exciting. There is a learning curve, obviously, to it but it's worth it. 
Number three, are the logistics of it manageable? Yes, they are. Once you get comfortable with it, they are definitely manageable, okay? Again, there is an element of having to put in that effort up front to be able to do so, but it definitely is. And is it supported by research? Yes, blended learning is supported by research. You go out there and you can seek it out and look into it. It's supported by research as being something that is, that is important for kids and go back to the previous slides of future ready skills and it gives opportunities to provide those future ready skills. So could it be done within my walls? Could it be done without my walls? Is it in the best interest of kids? Is it in the best interest of staff? Is it in the, or excuse me, is, are the logistics of it manageable and is it supported by research? If the answers to all of those questions are yes, those final four, and if it is yes to the fact that it can be done in and out, out, in, within the walls and outside the walls, then you're fit, starting to move your way towards a blended learning classroom. And I'm just, I'm not sure, Steve, if you've had a chance to take a look at the chat of the different things that have been dropped in there, but while you've been talking, I've been kind of scrolling through there and um, we're hoping that some of those things were addressed as we went through here. One of the things that I keep seeing crop up here is is this equitable for my special education students is this you know which i i love i love that question because again you're thinking about steve's first question in his filter here is this in the best interest for kids right and one thing i can tell you when i did blended learning in my classroom and i did self-paced instruction and and everything's personalized that it's not just in the best interest for kids with special needs, right? I, I know in my classroom, I spent so much time bringing kids up to grade level. And I think we, a lot of us probably fall victim to this as teachers, spend so many times like, oh my gosh, this kid isn't meeting grade level. This kid doesn't have the standard, you know, we're trying to get these. Who are we ignoring when we do that, right? Our students who, who get it, right? Students who need something extra. And I can tell you for the first five years of my teaching, I did not do a very good job with those kids. And now take this with a grain of salt, because the other thing that we're going to tell you is you can't just pick up someone's system and put your, take their blended learning system and put it into your classroom. We're going to be giving you some structures or actually our next slide here that we're going to talk about is four core, like fundamental elements of a blended learning classroom. The key is to put your own spin on it. And so I was at a time in my life where I could dedicate an entire Saturday planning for Steve, right? I knew Steve needed something extra because Steve was just crushing the seventh grade ELA standard and Steve needed something more, but the rest of my kids needed something, need, need, needed what I was currently giving them, right? And so I could personalize for Steve. But the same thing works on the other end of that spectrum where my students are moving on, but this student needs more scaffolding. This student needs more one-on-one -on -one attention. This student needs a small, some small group work that I, I could do that because I was in an environment where kids were working at their own pace and had control over some of their learning. And because they had so much ownership and it wasn't so dependent on me to stand and deliver and give them information, I was able to accommodate for those kids on a much more personal level. So again, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because we're about to talk about that, but. But I, I really like that. And what I like where this is headed, and, <clears throat> and let's just think about this for a second, because it's great, right? The special ed qu the question always comes up. Special ed is personalized, right? That is why a kid gets, di oh. that's why a kid gets to be in special ed. It's personalized learning for that child. The same thing happens with 504 plans across the state. You have a five, I had a 504 plan growing up right? I have dyslexia. I had a 504 plan because it was personalized to me. All we're doing here is taking what we know is good teaching for our most needy of the population and giving it to everyone. But in order to do that, you have to change the structure so that teachers have more time individually with every single kid. Otherwise, you can't. You can't have more time individually with every kid in your classroom in the same structure we've had since the early 1900s. It doesn't work. It can't be done. So we have to think about how does the structure change? And that's what this is about, right? So I want you to think about that. Yes, it's a great question about special ed, but special ed teachers are already personalizing. They are personalization specialists. That's what a special ed teacher does. We need, to, we need to capture that. We need them to support us general ed teachers in saying, how do I specialize for all, which we call personalized learning. One of the questions that keeps coming up, and I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on this, is what's the difference between blended learning and a flipped classroom? Are they the same? Are they the different? 
What does that, what does it mean for you? How do you see that, that overlap of the difference between a blended learning classroom and a flipped classroom? Steve, do you well, mind if I take point? Because like, like, <laughs> mind if I <laughs> So hold on, a, hold on a second. Cause what I was going to, what I was going to answer, cause I saw that and I wanted to bring it up as well. And then I'll, I'll, I'll leave it into you. I'll, I'll set it up for you to, to, to dunk in the alley. You did that earlier today and I missed it. So like yeah, 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 yeah. second time here. So, but Betty had mentioned in there, had mentioned about blended learning. Cause I think it is important that we need to define what it is and everybody kind of wrap their mind around it. But she said that it's a universal design for learning to address unique learning needs. Standards are firm method flexibility. Awesome. 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 That is it. That is it. That's the whole idea. So when we start talking about a flipped classroom, I will defer to Stefan because I know that there is a passion level like here on flipped classroom and let him talk about it. But I think they do definitely go hand in hand. I wouldn't say that they're synonyms of one another, but they definitely do go hand in hand. And I think we've been almost forced into thinking about flipped classroom type of format in this emergency distance learning that then hopefully can carry over into the fall. So with that, Stefan, here's the alley-oop, go. All right, so here's the deal. I, and I'm gonna give you this guy's TED talk at the end here. I went to NCCE several years ago and I'm a storyteller. I'm gonna clip this down a little bit cause I'm looking at her time and we've got a little bit of a playground coming up here. So I went to, I went to this session almost on a whim cause I saw a game, like video game in the title. And I was like, hey. His name was Paul Anderson. He, if you've watched the YouTube channel for AP Bio, he's he's a guy that runs that. He's a consultant, goes all over the place. Well, he's ta he is talking about how he had flipped his classroom. I had never heard of a flipped classroom before. So my blended learning classroom journey started by trying to flip my classroom and it failed like hardcore for the exact thing that you guys are seeing right now because the only thing we've been hearing about for weeks from teachers is, is lack of engagement from your students right and so I was gung-ho over the summer I was like I'm flipping my classroom I remember going to Monica McAtee was in here I remember going to dinner with her and Marlon Howell and Lynn Fry uh, over in Portland and I just remember saying, I didn't know you could teach like that. I didn't know this was a thing. Why wouldn't I go one-on-one -on -one with all of my kids, right? I can, and so I was just, I was on fire, right? And I spent the summer planning things and, and, and re-watching his TED Talk over and over to try to identify my own philosophy. And I had this grand vision. So a flipped classroom is kids get the instruction at home and do the activities in class, right? I mean, you are flipping. So whereas what we would normally identify as like, homework maybe that we send home. You do that stuff, you do the activities in class and the stuff that you would normally do in a traditional classroom where you deliver information, kids watch through asynchronous video at home. And I was so jazzed and on fire. My kids didn't do the stuff at home, right? And I, mostly because I just refused to let it fail, was like, I'm not fighting that battle. I can't go into each and every one of their homes. I'm not gonna, like, I, th I thought of my, my, my population, my, my, again, I'm teaching seventh grade. I know these kids are doing sports and academics after school, they're going home and they're babysitting. I've got a lot of students coming from poverty. Like, I'm not gonna fight that battle. I knew that I could control what happens in my classroom when I have them. And so I, I actually had not even heard of the term blended learning. I just kind of naturally gravitated into that where I created a personalized system where kids through the power of asynchronous video and tools like slides and classroom and, and websites and then all these other tertiary tools took control over the pace primarily of their learning and worked through and there's a lot of things that are do different, but a district adopted curriculum at their own pace. And then I was building in other things. So when I see questions like, how do I do this with a district adopted curriculum that has its built in pacing guide? Standards, baby, you know, and I built in this control into my classroom and 100% of my time was spent problem solving with kids. And so when I tell this to people, I'm like, I'm walking around, I'm one-on-one -on -one conferencing with my students. I'm giving in real-time feedback. My kids are turning something in. It's not up to code. They haven't met the standard in this. So they go back and they redo it through a different lens that I've created for them in the moment. When I tell, tell people that, they go, that sounds like a lot of work. And I'm like, yeah. And it was great. Cause think of all the work you put in normally, but then sometimes those things don't go exactly the way you want when you're adapting and differentiating in real time in the moment it's life-changing it's unbelievable and so i would say the difference between a flipped classroom versus a versus blended learning instead of requiring students to do a certain element of work at home and they come ready for activities it's a more fluid concept if that makes sense 
Steve, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? And I know no, I, I yeah. took a lot no, of No, you time, nailed but... it. No, you nailed it. You nailed it. And I think there's elements of the flipped classroom that can be used in a blended learning classroom, right? But it's not like rigid to the point that that's the only thing. There's more, there's more freedom to be able to do some additional things uh, on that, where it doesn't have to just be all, all at home. The thing that I was going to add before we move on to the, the next slide here and, and start to get into some of the foundational aspects is there was a question that came up in the chat. I'm trying to remember exactly how it was worded, but it was, if you give choice, will some of the students that have already completed some of the work choose the easy option, right? And then somebody had responded and said, no, they tend to challenge themselves. And that's all kind of individual student by individual student and what their kind of standards and perspective is to education and what they're doing. But I will tell you this, that it is new for students also. Okay, so like we said, this is new for them. And so when you throw this at them and they learn how to play school and all of a sudden it's different, there might be a, some initial resistance to it, but especially if you can make it exciting and especially if you continue to, to show them that they have more freedom over the path of their learning, they will buy in. And this has really been effective in my classroom and allowing them to buy in and be able to dig deeper into their, what, they, what they want to learn. So you do need to kind of help, help them with that. That being said, Let's talk a little bit about the four foundational aspects of a blended learning classroom, huh? It's like, you know, it was coming up here, Steve, because that number one is building a classroom culture. I remember I had this great idea for giving my kids this project on like on, on reading and I gave them all these options, right? For, I mean, let's call it a book report, but it wasn't really that. I gave them all these options and I was so excited. They could use a video editor to create a commercial for the book. They could, and post it to YouTube and they could create their own podcast. And then because I felt like I was being culturally respo responsive, I gave them the option to do a traditional book report. And I really wish I hadn't done that because guess what 90% of my kids chose? It was the book report. And and in my head, I was thinking I was giving them choice because like some kids like to write. But the reality is kids will choose what they're comfortable with. It's because they've, it's what they've always done. And I would argue the same, the same is true for the majority of adults, right? We, when, we're, when we are provided with a new option, human nature is to say, uh-oh, you know, like I, I don't know about this. And you ask those four filter questions that, that Steve was presenting us with. So when you're giving students choice, Yes, they, they will sometimes, like Steve said, it's, a, it's an individual thing, but sometimes they will choose that easier option because it's what they're comfortable with, which is where classroom culture comes into play. Because we're talking about things like critical thinking, rigor, failure, and retrying that task. And students are not comfortable with that. And if they are not in an environment where they feel safe to fail because they know they will be supported, safe to take a risk, then they're not going to take those risks because why would they? Right? So the first thing that we need to do is set up a classroom culture where we set up expectations for behavior and engagement, right? We're in, things I like to say to my students are we're in a professional environment. This is what I expect from you, right? This is how we act in a professional environment right there. Having that meaningful conversation and starting off your year with those types of things right there eliminates all kinds of di digital citizenship problems, right? You're talking about how to behave with future ready skills and connectivity professionally in an online community and an offline community, because that's what blended learning is. How are we going to behave? And then what do I expect from you in terms of engagement? Remember that high structure. These are part of our structures that we're building in for students. How are we supporting them so that they can take ownership over their own learning? But one just, thing, I would, add, one go, thing go. I would add to that would be just, and, and I think this is a good reflection for every teacher. Do my students see our classroom when we say our classroom, do they understand we mean both our physical and digital classroom? How do we as teachers start to use, start to use word and verbiage that our classroom isn't just physical or digital, that our classroom includes both? Because that helps to build that culture that the same rules apply in both spaces. Right? And a lot of times we end up in this thing like, oh, well, that is that classroom and this is this classroom. And we have to start using words and we have to start framing things so that students understand it's both of these places, right? Both of these places are our classroom. And that helps to also create that classroom culture. I love Alexis's comment just in the yeah. chat there. The classroom is the community and not the physical constraints. Again, mm. with and without With and walls. without walls, baby. That's what I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah, that's now beautiful. We're rolling. So on that note, it is important for students to know what to expect of you. 
right? When we start talking about a blended classroom, there's a lot of things that get blended, digital, physical, and then also, and this is a reality, work hours. I, my wife had to set some very clear boundaries when I was at home for when it was time to put the phone away because I put Google Hangouts on my phone and I was so excited about being able to respond to a student's question because they're sending me questions about the work that they're trying to catch up on or something for them working ahead, right? They're working ahead of where I want them to be and they're asking me how to do something and they're asking these questions about my content. And I'm like, <laughs> and she's like, you have to be done working right? You had, there has to be a time. And so setting those expectations of if you send me an email or whatever a preferred mode of communication is after 5 PM, I'm not going to respond to you. I will get back to you starting at 7 AM the next morning, but know that these are my times on and off and telling kids that that is okay. That is okay to set those structures, but also what can they expect from you in terms of support? Clearly, this is going to be a change for a lot of kids, clearly communicating that if you fail, but you are trying, I am here to give you whatever you need. So that way you can work your way towards success, right? So be thinking, we're going to ask you about this a little bit in a second here. So prep, be thinking about what you can do to create a culture of high expectations, of rigor, of support. I like to start off my class the first day with a really demanding activity, something that re required them to work together and did not have a correct answer because no one gets it, but it's kind of goofy and kind of fun. So we're all in there together, but the idea is productive struggle. The next foundation, and those of you who've been going through the Reimagine Why Ed stuff will be very familiar with this term, and this is going to be kind of a big thing moving forward, which is you need to have a home base, a place for kids to go. This will be a, for Google, it's Google Classroom, right? I ran everything through Google Classroom. If my kids were getting something, they knew it was in Google Classroom. This is insanely important for not just your kids, so that way, as they're starting to learn to manage their schedule and take control over their time, they know where to go to get their stuff. But it's also important for families, because if you can tell a parent everything they will ever need is in our learning management system, is in Microsoft Teams, is in Canvas, is in Classroom, is in Schoology, is in Flipgrid, whatever it is, they know it's there. That consistency and structure is key. And then define what that organization is going to look like. Steve's been talking to you about our wayfinding techniques in here, which is something you've seen going through the Reimagine Wide stuff too. What are these significant icons that you can leave for your kids? That way when they, these visual cues and reminders that, the, that way they know if it's labeled this way, this is what's expected of me. And then personalize that, right? We, I can tell you how I set up my Google Classroom. That might not work for you. Just like your work is gonna be personalized for students, you're gonna need to personalize your, uh, your learning management system and home base for your kids as well. Number three is feedback and collaboration. So that is a big one. We, those first two are really those foundational structure, getting things going. As you start to get into blended learning, really maximizing feedback and collaboration for your students. How can they get feedback from you? How can they give feedback to each other? And this is my favorite one. How can the students give you feedback? I always just put a reflection question. Is there anything you need to tell me at the end of every re reflection my students did? They, I got feedback in terms of structure on my Google Classroom, home life, funny jokes, everything, right? So how can we be building in feedback and collaboration, not just teacher to student, student to student, and student to teacher? And this last one, this is always a fun conversation, and I mean that genuinely, which is assessment. What are we grading? I know there's some stuff going through the chat there, and I, if we had the next three hours to talk about it, we would, but I know that I moved to a, I always call it mastery. I need to move away from that proficiency-based grading system where everything was done to 100%. So if this assignment is worth 20 points, then you're going to redo it and redo it and redo it. And I'm going to help you and support you along that way until you earn that 20 points, right? But that made grading easy for me because I knew that I was giving feedback in the process and students, when they, when they were done, when they're ready for the next assignment, they had 100 points and they moved on there. So I got to rethink my grade book in there, but be thinking about what is graded, what isn't? The big conversation is cheating. How do we create assignments and assessments where students can't cheat because it requires higher level thinking? And then maybe Steve, if you could talk about this one a little bit, because you've done a great job with this, this idea that if we are doing formative assessment correctly, if we are giving feedback in the process of learning, no one fails the summative assessment. That's more of a reflection on me as a teacher. If a student fails that summative, 
than it is on my student's knowledge. So Steve, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of the a concept we were talking about, I think, last week and, you know, bouncing around with, I think it was with Tyler in one of the sessions. And, you know, if we do a good job of evaluating and assessing the process rather than the product, giving feedback on the process rather than the product, if we do a good job of having those conversations, and by the way, the blended classroom gives you more options to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with students, then all of a sudden, if we've done a good job and students have done a good job of putting in their portion of the effort, every final project should be an A, right? Every, pro every final project should be the best that they could do, the final product, I should say, the final product that they have should be in that spot. And I just love the fact that we've spent so many Thursdays with Stefan and Steve that we're like, like right here, because when you said, I feel like I can talk for three hours, I was about ready to interrupt you and go, how long is this session, Jeff? Do we have two hours? Do we have three hours? Because we can talk about the stuff that's coming up in the chat. I mean, literally, it almost came out of my mouth when you said that. But Scott said up here before, and, and you know, you talk about your, your utopia where you want to get to. I mean, if there's something that I could accomplish in my career that would make me feel like, man, if ever, this is exactly where I want to get to. Scott set up in the top, I think he said, um, or is that, I like the enrichment options. It seems like intrinsic motivation built through relationships is critical. Yes, intrinsic motivation comes through relationships and basically relationship building should be built into the model. He also said hey, along the lines of that they should be focused more upon, I think the learning rather than on the grade, right? And so if we can get to that particular point where students are intrinsically desiring to learn that is my utopia, right? I mean, that's where I would want to get to if I could. And I push it every day in my classroom. And the terminology that I use, especially with my high, the high achieving students, by the way, are the ones that are most challenged with this because they're the ones that have figured out school. They know how to get the A for the transcript, right? And so there, it, it was earlier in the chat talking about how students focus so much on the grade and not so much on the learning. My terminology that I use with them is if you focus on the grade, you won't learn anything. If you focus on the learning, the grade will take care of itself. And so we talk about it all the time about trying to get them to focus on the learning. And so I purposefully give assignments and work and learning opportunities that I tell them this is not graded purposely. Like I, like I'm, not, I'm not using the grade to hold over them to get them to pay attention and to do things. I tell them that we're doing things and whether it says 5,000 points, it's five points, it's zero points, the work ethic and what you need to do to learn should be the same. So trying to build that within my students and get them there. Some don't get there, some do, but if we can get them all to the point where they just want to learn because they want to learn, that's my utopia. That's where I want to get to. And just because our, our next, I think people are going to find valuable our next slide here. I, uh, <laughs> and, and it's 450. <laughs> Whoops, Steve, remember when we practiced and we're like, we're just gonna need to tone it down a little bit. And <laughs> then we got a little carried yeah, away. Uh, yeah. All right, All right. If we can get to the next slide though. No, well, I mean, could, it, as people, as we start to move on there, and I saw something come up that I do just want, want to just, just real quick talk about, uh, but as we're talking about that, uh, could you put in the chat, just take a second to think about what are some things that you can do to foster a classroom culture that expects higher learning, that expects rigor, that expects hard work? How can you foster a classroom culture and a home base specific to what you want out of your class? What are some first steps that you can take? I saw, and the other thing I just wanted to, I just think of, by the way, I'm going to interrupt you. What do you go, think go. of your thought? Because I feel like I'm being quoted and that feels, I, I feel like that means I've arrived. Dude, you're Somebody there. Quoted me, in the, quoted me in the chat. But yes, if you focus on the grade, you won't learn anything. If you focus on the learning, the grade will take care of itself. Uh, and I'm stealing that too. So there we go. I, I saw something on there about this is like, like unless you're dealing with a student with like oppositional defiance disorder, and which makes me think of a student in my personalized learning classroom who had oppositional defiance disorder. And obviously I will not say his or her name. I think of that student and I'm not, I am not, I do not want to come across as thinking that when we put in blended learning uh, and when we, when I created a self-paced classroom, that it was this utopian classroom where everything worked and every kid was self-motivated. It was, it was hard work and it was me holding kids accountable. Kids are kids, right? But I think of this student and I know what that student would have done in my traditional classroom. I would have failed that student. And not that I was ultimately super successful with this student, but I can tell you that this student was in my classroom 
and I won't go into all the ins and outs of what the student's home life was like, but they did not need seventh grade English standards. They did not need that. That was a lot. They weren't at grade level. They wouldn't, I could have given them the fifth grade stuff, whatever. They didn't need, they needed love and they needed attention and they needed support. And because of the system I'd set up in my classroom, that's what that kid got. And so when I think of, and when I think of my best and my worst day in a blended learning classroom, I think of that kid because on a daily basis, they came into my classroom halfway through the year and I was able to individualize my attention to that student. And my, my, my worst day is when I got a little overwhelmed and I acted in a way that I normally wouldn't with that student and he or she shut down. And I was like, oh, I came home to my wife who, who works in special education and knows that student. And I was like, I failed Stefan, right? Or I failed Stephanie. And, and she asked what happened, I explained. And I was able to repair that relationship because I was able to dedicate the time. And that's what our kids need. That's what a lot of our kids need is that, is that connection. And that's what a blended learning environment will give you. I see Betty, kids first, always, always kids first. So I, just, I always think of that student because I may not have taught that kid seventh grade English, but for the time she was in my classroom, because of the system that I had set up, I was able to give her what she needed. And it was amazing. So real quick, before you move on, you're being asked to, can you just quickly, 30 seconds, because you guys only got nine minutes left, <laughs> feed, feedback, <laughs> you're being asked to look at number three again and read just what did you say about feedback and collaboration? Why is that an important piece? Steve, you might be able to do it faster than I can. Do you want to take that? What I would say is this, is number one, collaboration is a future ready skill. It's something that we need to be able to provide opportunities for, for students to be able to collaborate with one another, but we also need to collaborate with our students to provide them feedback. Okay? And so that feedback to be able to say, this is what you need to improve on. This is why you need to uh, change. This is what you need to alter. I like what you did here will allow them to move forward in their, in their journey and what it is that they're trying to put together as their final product. And hopefully then if we're evaluating those, that feedback over the process, that the final product will be what we want it to be. And Stefan also mentioned, do not be afraid of getting feedback from your students about what you're doing in class for you also. So that feedback is significant there. We're passionate, Jeff. We're Beautiful. passionate. That's the deal. Beautiful. All right. So go to the next Beautiful. one. All Hit right. Me. So here's where we're at on this next portion of things is because some of you, we've been talking about the why we've been talking about the what, Okay, now we wanna talk about the how and give you some examples. So I'll try and run through this, which is gonna be a challenge because I am so passionate about the things that we get to show you. But again, remember learning with and without walls. So my freshman AP human geography class, and this is just an example that I worry about sharing because it seems like it's this big grandiose giant thing and it's not, it's really not. It's fairly straightforward in understanding what you can do. But AP with WE is a program that is, combines College Board AP programs with WE Day. And some of you out there are probably familiar with WE Day, but WE Day was created with the idea of trying to encourage giving back to communities on a local and a global level for teenagers. And, to, on the, and the AP with WE program is the idea of trying to teach content through service learning that is real world service learning. So my students over the last few years in AP Human Geography have done projects where they've worked on food insecurity and hunger in our local community and globally. And they've also worked on access to healthcare, both locally and globally. So they currently are working this year on, and it kind of got shut down with the pandemic to some degree, but we have a surgeon who's Ugandan born, who's living in Uganda with his wife, who are building a hospital for the people of Iganga because they don't necessarily have all access to healthcare. And so my students have partnered with them to try and help build this hospital. And in preparation for a Google Hangout that we did, they had this document, this is just a portion of it. It was ended up being about three pages long and I blacked out student names and such, but this was a shared Google document okay, that again, this is something we could have done within the walls of our classroom having students write it down on pieces of paper, have small group discussion. I could bring in a guest speaker into the classroom to be able to talk to them, but we couldn't necessarily do that because Isaac and Rachel were in Uganda, but yet we can still collaborate with them. Okay, when we can collaborate within the walls, talking about what we're trying to put together here, but this was in preparation for a Google Hangout that we were gonna have, that I wanted them to just kind of crowdsource some questions that they had for them and then brainstorm ideas as to how they can help. Now there was some front loading of food, or excuse me, of access to healthcare and what they were going through in Uganda where they got a chance to do some research, but they then put these questions together. I shared this document with Isaac and Rachel so they were prepared 
and then they joined us for a Google Hangout for 50 minutes in my classroom. Okay, and I think there's a picture of it that's there. I was gonna show you the video, but then you have privacy issues with the students and such. But this is Isaac and Rachel from their home in Uganda at about 11 o'clock at night, eight o'clock a.m. our time, because that's when they were, we were able to connect and make, make it work. The challenge, the most significant challenge to this wasn't connecting with them. Isaac, or excuse me, Rachel is my wife's cousin, so I had that connection. But you all, there, there are Twitter, there's, there's tons of different ways that you can make connections globally to be able to do something like this. But the most challenging piece was the time. And the most challenging piece with the time was because my class was from eight to 8.55. You take that constraint off with like we are on a digital or an online learning model, then it becomes a whole lot easier to make those different types of connections. So again, a project that could be done inside and outside the walls of our classroom and has significant impact upon students because it's real world learning techniques that applies then our human geography content of everything that we're talking about throughout the course of having these discussions. And the student buy-in, the relationship and culture that is built from getting an opportunity to talk with somebody in Uganda is just powerful beyond all, I can't even explain how powerful it is. It's significant. So one other example that we did, um, I think is, is, is it on there as well? Yeah, click on the Hangouts one, yeah. So is when Jeff and I first started working together, we did a um, simple assignment. I think it was about a two day assignment, three day assignment about an event that was going on in the Middle East. And basically we got in contact with some teachers that were teaching in Kuwait and some teachers that were teaching in Saudi Arabia. We did a reading article. They added questions to that reading article and we used those questions to drive what our next learning piece was going to be in preparation for the Google Hangout. So you can see one of the teachers in the lower corner down there and my class and then other teachers that you see on the screen that we did a Google Hangout to talk about the events that were happening in the Middle East, about current events that were related to our curriculum. And again, had to do with connections, yes, but it's a very great way to bring in things that are outside the walls of our classroom. Whereas we could have just done something where we read about that event and discussed it in class. We could have done it within the walls, but it has power when you knock down the four walls and make learning global. So, and just kind of calling an audible here, tell me, Steve, tell me if you're okay with this. Um, we, I mean, we'd be happy to talk about this, but we do want to honor your time as you're here. Steve, are you okay moving into the four yep. steps? Okay. Yeah. Good, yeah. So go ahead and take it away, man. So step number one, okay, and what we're, what we're talking about um, as far as implementing this blended learning and making it manageable for you is number one, a belief in a, just a belief set that you can do this. Believing in yourself, believing in your students, giving them freedom to be able to do this and trust in them because I know some of the things came up about classroom management, but you need to be willing to try something new and be willing to take those risks and again, failing fast and failing loud. So I guess what I would ask of you, maybe on a piece of paper or you put it in the chat because you can make a commitment while we're going through these four steps, is what is one lesson or unit maybe in the fall, thinking forward, that you could go, you know, I could, I could see myself reworking this to be able to be something we could do within the walls and outside the walls. You know, you could write it down because that becomes more of a commitment and you can even put it into the chat and say, hey, this is what I'm gonna think I can do to be able to get started with it. And I would recommend start small, start with something simple, start with something that's not this big grandiose project, but something that's fairly simple. And then step two, now these are built off those foundational aspects there. You should be seeing those two kind of line up. Step two is to learn your tools. What do you have access to? I know there were some questions going through there in the chat about access to devices and internet. And those are systemic things that need to be addressed by your district, right? We're starting to realize or have realized for a while that access to tech it's an essential when it comes to education because we can do things like blended learning. And keep in mind that remember blended learning at its core is the best of both worlds, right? That's all we're doing is how can we move things online and, and offline and take advantage of those tools to the best of their ability. And so learn your tools, feed yourself, go to YouTube and, and understand the ins and outs of Google Classroom or Teams and fiddle with those different features based off of what you want for kids. Personalize that, come up with a structure for how you want to set that up. Set that and communicate that to your kids. Follow those protocols. Again, personalize your system, but be consistent at every single step of the way. So once you have these, you've got your philosophy down. I want my kids to take ownership over their learning. I want my instruction to be personalized. I want to work in small groups with my kids and do a blended model. Okay, so I need to know what I'm working with. And what's step three, Steve? So step three is again, continuing to say start simple, right? And think outside the walls of your classroom. 
I will go back to the questions that I mentioned to you previously. And that is, is this something I could do within the walls and outside the walls of my classroom? Is it in the best interest of kids? Is it in the best interest of staff? Okay, what I'm trying to put together, is it manageable? And is it supported by research? Okay, those are the main things okay, on what it is that you need to do to get started with this is just starting simple. And so I love in the chat that somebody put in there that I'm already texting somebody about alterations to our first unit in biology. Right? That's what I'm talking because, about. Because that's exactly what the question and the ask was going to be for this particular spot is to jot down and write down how and who could you possibly collaborate with to create this blended learning environment as you move forward. And then finally, as far as step four, you need to be able to evaluate and modify. So as you move forward, this is like taking off on a rocket journey, right? As you move forward to be able to do this, you need to understand that things are going to happen okay, that are going to not work perfectly and you have to be able to modify and you have to be able to shift and change. New tech is gonna come up or new tools are gonna come up. Okay? You need to be able to feed yourself okay? and share your findings with others, right? Others are going through a similar journey. They can help support you and collaborate with your fellow educators. Okay? And so the gift, of the SpaceX rocket taking off, okay, is you taking off in your journey moving forward with blended learning because you've got this and you can do this. And just as a, fi as a final word here before, I don't know, are we cool doing a and a Like I can stick around for a while, but I know we're at an hour. I'm good for however long. We got other examples to show if people want to do <laughs> uh, Going out and finding places to shape your philosophy. This one, I just put it in the chat. That is Paul Anderson. That was my inspiration for flipped classroom and blended learning. And it really talks about I mean, he starts off by saying what he did wrong, which is the most amazing mindset. It's inquiry-based teaching. Uh, he, he says, don't kill the wonder. It's amazing. And then this one, he, his name's Simon Sinek. And he is, I, I don't know, man. I love that guy. He, he, that's his video on moving from uh, what to why to how. And that's how I framed all of my lessons in uh, or, or sorry why to how to uh, why to what to how starting with the why is the key there is kids don't care what they're learning they care they care why they're learning it and if we can get kids to internalize to find a need for what they're learning to understand why they're learning it and really take ownership of that that's that utopian classroom that we're thinking of you know that's what we're shooting for is these self-motivated kids because they're doing things they have control over them and, and, and so that one, he's a business guy, but holy cow, that was a big one for me. So yeah, all right, awesome. look at that, 503, we, could be one. And we didn't, we didn't do this earlier, Steph, and we were gonna tell our cohorts that they needed to put in there that they were from our cohort, because we were gonna <laughs> try and show how many showed up. But I'm happy and we're happy next week or in future ones to share some samples or talk a little bit more about this as well. There's cohort eight, cohort eight. That's what house. I'm talking about. There we go, mm -hmm, there we're mm -hmm, talking, now mm -hmm. we're talking. See, love it, all right. Can you guys maybe go over one more example? There's a lot of people who would like to see another example of one of those ways. You know, I know Steve, you shared shared one of yours. Can yeah, maybe I have do one, one that more I example. Share, then, but I want Stefan to share his. Yeah, one. I've got I've got some questions here for you too. If we can stick around, people yeah. can leave. You can watch this recording. We'll be on the re, uh, on YouTube if you need to get out of here. Um, it'll also be on the Reimagine website under uh, resources. But if you want to stick around, uh, we're going to stick around for a little bit, answer some questions, and geek out with you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, let's look at another example. Yeah. So I'll do the podcasting one because Steve asked me to do that yesterday. And I, I really want to go through the, the, the website that I did with the, with the physics kids. And he's like, you should do the podcasting one because the audio stuff. So, so that's what I'm doing. And I love it. And it's great. It's fantastic. They're just both good examples. So this is from an eighth grade social studies teacher who works in Moses Lake. And she said one day she walked into her classroom and this, this is the example of being vulnerable and getting feedback with her kids and they love it. She walked into her classroom and said, what we're about to do is so boring. Like she had made these lesson plans and she looked at them and she told her kids, it's so boring. Like the way I'm about to go teaching you this just stinks. And so then she said, here's my idea. And she brainstormed in front of them. Now she can do this because she's done these things where she developed a culture of rigor. She knows, her kids know that when she comes in there and says, this is boring, I wanna do something different. First and foremost, she has a focus on what she wants the kids to learn. It's not about the task, it's about the essential learning from here. So her kids know that, right? This was this past January, I think I was in there. And so she's teaching them some things about, about American history and she was gonna have them do this project, but, but what she said instead, she goes, I want you to make a podcast. 
that is a future ready skill because it's not just, it's not about making the podcast. It's about all the work that leads up to that, which is organization. They had to work together. You know how hard it is to create a podcast together with someone else. You know, the kind of flow you need, like you should have seen these eighth graders. It was mind blowing. Right. And so I'm going to talk to you about how this gets blended because it sounds very high tech, which it's not, but I'll, t- I'll tell you here. It was this authentic environment, right? Where kids are having to do all of these skills. And there's those speaking and listening things. And all the while they're digging into the content. So the blended learning portion comes in in this is her kids didn't even start making the podcast for like a week and a half to two weeks. That was, that was down the road. They didn't even, they were on the computers, but they're not fiddling with recording software. They are researching. They're getting control over the path of their learning and the pace at which they do it. Again, eighth graders are, they're in the textbook and they're taking notes, but they're also researching things online and they're doing things. And some of my favorite moments in her classroom where a kid would just say, did you know that? And she'd go, no. And she would stop the entire class and they'd all just explore this little product, this little project, right? Uh, This one time I get this, the reason I found out about this project, she didn't even tell me about it. And the reason I found out about this project is she sends me a Google Hangout and says, hey, what was the thing we learned in the Jeff Udick training about finding the, the websites from other countries? And I said, well, what are you doing? Because I knew she was doing something cool. And so I told her what it was. A kid had asked about the American Revolution. Well, what did, what did Britain think about all of this? Are you kidding me? There's an eighth grader because of the environment that she's built asking about the other side of the American Revolution? Jaw dropping, amazing, right? And so these kids are doing all of their planning offline. They're doing some work in the textbook. They're doing some work online. They're finding these different resources. They're asking, they're vetting these different things. And then only then when they've done all the work, do they get to make their podcast. And that can seem intimidating because how do you make a podcast? Well, she told the kids, here are some tools that you can use and here are some things, but if you find something better, go for it. And I'm in there filming kids and like watching things that are going on. And I say to this kid, I'm never going to forget this. I said, we're almost done here. Uh, Hold on just like two minutes because that way you can start recording and you're not going to have any background noise of us in our podcast. He goes, oh no, it's fine. I found that I found this extension that eliminates background noise. Unbelievable. None of us had ever heard of it. This kid had just gone and found these tools that he needed because she had built in those structures. And so it was all about using the best of both online and offline, but to meet, instead of having them take Cornell notes out of a, out of a textbook, just this one source, and they found all of this information and all of these different sources and were able to synthesize that because of her giving that freedom in that blended learning environment. And then her job was to walk around and facilitate the learning, was to ask questions, to make sure kids were on task, were to, was to uh, inspire kids when they need it, su- provide extra support. And for those kids that were just absolutely crushing it, push them a little bit farther and differentiate in the moment. It was this beautiful, beautiful lesson. But if you ask her about it, of course, she's gonna say, ah, well, it wasn't a big deal. But it was amazing, amazing. All right, let's get to some questions real quick. Uh, here's a question from Valerie. What parts are highly structured and what parts are loosely organized? Um, so Stefan, we talked about that story. Here's my story, right? We were going to start with it. And I was like, no, I'm going to hold off because something's going to come up in the webinar that I can tell the story. So my journey with blended learning started, I don't know, four or five years ago, six years ago, when I met some guy named Jeff Udick. Okay? And so in going through this scenario, I've had many failures and many things that have really made me rethink how I do things. And I mentioned earlier that I'm really much, very much a type A personality, kind of like things in structure, but yet I like the creative part of it as well. So letting go of that ownership of direction of my class was a challenging piece for me. But I even got to the point where I felt like I was enabling, enabling I was handholding my students through a lot of things and that they weren't being asked to think for themselves, that they were expecting me to give them so much information that I really started to feel like I was over explaining things to the point where they didn't feel like they had to listen because they could just ask questions and go back. So I I wanted to go the complete opposite way. So I talked with my principal one time and I said, look, I I wanna try and go a different way. I wanna just say, hey, this is what I want you to do and go. And the support that I had was awesome. It was like, go ahead and go for it. And so last year we really took it to an extreme and friend of mine, two friends of mine, colleagues, one a science teacher, one an English teacher, and I tried to put together a project that we called the Impress Me Project. And this was our brilliant idea. We said, all right, we are going to ask these three classes to collaborate with one another, cross curriculum, and we are going to simply ask you to impress us, right? We're going to take all the reins off. We are not even going to grade it. 
we are going to just say impress us. And we gave them a basic question of how did we get here? And of course they were confused, which we said that's part of the process, right? That's part of the process. And we thought it was the greatest thing because we were asking them to just impress us and they had freedom and they're gonna take off and they're gonna do all kinds of great things. <laughs> it was awful. It was terrible. It did not work at all. And we got done and went, oh my gosh, this was just the biggest failure ever because you can't say to a 17 year old kid, no grade, no nothing, just do whatever you want because they're not going to do anything. And it was like, what were we thinking, right? The intention was in the right spot, but it just really didn't work. So learning from that moving forward into this year, I have incorporated into each one of my units what I call their self-guided project. And so in the self-guided project, they have highly structured, a, pro a highly structured process to come up with what their topic is to be able to, um, I guess, if you would argue for why they want that to be their topic, then they have certain steps that they have to reach by certain times. And then they have to sh be able to tell me how they're going to produce their learning and how they're going to show me their learning. And they have to meet with me or email me to tell me about that. So notice I'm not talking about any structured aspect of what it is that they're learning. I'm talking about the structure of how they're going to go about the learning. And they have choice over path of what they're learning. And it's been awesome. The kids have loved it but I would not have gotten to that point without the <laughs> failure of last mm. year to be able to understand how that works. So that's how I would describe that. I don't know what Stefan. I like like. That. And basically, I mean, if I was to, and I love this cause it's just like, as you were talking, I was just like, Oh yeah, that's it. You structure the how, not the what. Yes. Right. You structure the how, how are you going to learn this, but you don't structure what you're going to learn within the how. So the structure is around the how, right? That's the pathway. And you're gonna to continue to hear these words called, or this term called pathways as we move into next fall and we get into really blended learning environments. Um, so thank you for that. I, lo I love that, the way that you, you, you talked about that. We had a couple questions real quick following up on this and we'll get back to the questions. Is Sherry and Joanne were asking, are there any ideas for high school math? Uh, honors algebra, algebra or algebra two? And I will just say, if I was an algebra teacher, I would be trying to teach everything I possibly could through spreadsheets. One of the skills, every single time that I talk with businesses, business owners, I talk with small businesses and large businesses, when I ask them, what is one skill that we should be make sure we graduate kids with, it is spreadsheets. And you could teach almost the entirety of the algebra curriculum inside spreadsheets. That's what spreadsheets do. And think about what that might look like if you gave kids big, unorganized data and you had to organize it. The second thing I would be thinking about is how do you visualize data? Even in algebra, how do you set up an algebraic expression that gives you numbers, that gets you data? And then how do you visualize that data? Understanding that part of math today is also art. That is a great crossover. Because a lot of our math classes, we have to understand that what we're really talking about, when we have big data sets, I mean big data sets like we're playing with in the world today. One of the ways you have to, we have to think about is what's the best way to present that data? And one of the things I would be focusing on if I was an algebra teacher would be infographics. How do I get kids to take data make it visual and put it in something called an infographic so other people can read it. And there is data all over the internet. There is data about every stoplight in your hometown if you wanna find it. There are stops, there's, there's data about the river flow. There's data about you know, pollution data. I mean, there's data about whatever you want kids to organize. So kids can have personalized by what big piece of data do you wanna look at and then how are you going to make sense of it? So if any, any math classroom, I, the one thing I would, that would to me would be my blended learning, right? It would be my why. Why is algebra important? Because algebra is what spreadsheets are and spreadsheets run the world. Done, <laughs> right? Done. And then I would set up those things for that. Next question for you guys. And I, I would really like to, because both of you have done this in your classroom. So I think this is a really good question. What about classroom management? It seems really busy and difficult to keep track of students. And this is from Stephanie. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> so it really is. It's stressful yeah. the first time you do it, but it really is. Yeah, well, here, here's the crazy thing, right? And this, this is not what people think. No one told me this. No one told me this. I get my blended learning environment going, right? Things have fall, fallen flat in his face and I've decided to do personalized learning. I teach my kids the system. We've gone through everything. It's time for the first lesson, right? Everyone's starting in the same spot. I get them going. And like the next day I'm like, 
I'm kind of like looking around over my shoulder, very self-conscious because I'm going, I'm lonely. Like we love kids, right? I love interacting with kids. And when kids first started going and they were self-sufficient, I was like, "Uh uh-oh, like, what do I do? Now that question was answered very quickly, right? I facilitate their learning and kids are going to be kids. And, but my answer to that actually is a simple one. So, so first there was, there was, oh no, my kids are all at least occupied. I wouldn't have called them engaged at that point, but occupied, right? They're doing something. And what do I do with myself? Cause I'm not delivering information anymore, which as I think back was a very cool moment. But then in terms of classroom management, I always had the occasional screwball, right? But my kids always had something productive to be doing always. It wasn't, or, and I should actually change that always something productive to be engaged in. There never was the option for them to be goofing around because there was unstructured time. I mean, they're, you know, I guess that was not the correct wording to use, but like they, there was never any busy work because then if they were waiting on me, I found that the bottleneck in the system was me and I had to build ways to, to get me more efficient, but I had a rolling list of things that kids could be working on. Oh, okay. You're done with this assignment. You're waiting to reflect with me. Go teach yourself coding. Why not? There's so many free coding websites out there. So I had kids teaching themselves coding in the class because they're interested in it. Um, I had, I had this kind of ongoing, uh, call them book projects, but things they could be working on passively to really inspire a love for reading. And so what I found was, and this is not going to be a very satisfying answer, classroom management wasn't really the issue because my kids were engaged. And when you have engaged kids, they don't really want to be screwing around. And it was a, it, again, that's not a super helpful answer, but if they, if they are engaged with what they're doing, classroom management isn't really an issue. Yeah, and I guess what I would say to that, and not not to put, I don't know what the right word would be, but I know having gone through uh, education classes in college, when you get your teaching certificate, and it, what you're presented is that, you know, engaging lesson reduces or gets rid of classroom management issues, and then you get in the classroom and you realize that that's a bunch of bull, right? It, does, it doesn't really work that way. But on the other hand, they are more engaged. And what I would say is the big cha- big change for me was that if I was doing a traditional 30 year old type of assignment, I could keep them working and on pace and whatever, but it was more an adversarial kind of, why are you not on pace? Why are you not doing what you're doing? I was able to answer questions, but a lot of times there were questions that became annoying by fifth period because I've had to answer them 50 times. And it really wasn't conversations about learning. When we first, when I first went to the blended learning type of model, exactly like Steph and I all of a sudden felt like, man, I don't really feel like I'm doing anything. I'm supposed to be like saying things and monitoring things and they're doing these other areas. But then you started to realize that you could have really real conversations with students. Like you could go sit down and talk with them and say, hey, what are you working on? And they were excited to tell you as opposed to the worksheet that you gave me, right? And so you're able to have conversations with them that were very much about the real learning that was happening and it became and it became energizing for me and exciting for me and i remember actually having this moment of this is why i signed up to be a teacher is to have these conversations it wasn't to tell them to put their cell phone away and why are you not doing your work and why are you not doing whatever with and that you can, said oh, go okay, i was gonna say with that said it's not a magic bullet either you still have students that have struggles with work ethic or work completion or focus or I mean, those things are still there, but that's part of what we do as educators is, right, is trying to help them in those different areas. Well, and you'll never be more hyper aware of them than you are in a blended learning classroom because right. you, you are so, that's, that's, the, if, that's the foundational piece of this is your relationships with kids. And that's the number one pushback I get from teachers is blended learning is great, personalized learning is great, but I value my relationships with my kids, which is, is an offensive thing to say to me because there is nothing I value more than my relationships with my kids. And that's why I'm a coach is because I saw what blended learning can do for relationships in the classroom. And I, two weeks into my blended learning environment, I broke down my teacher desk and I put it in the corner so kids could choose to work there. And I went and I bought a stool off Amazon because I was spending so much time walking around my classroom and sitting down in front of kids. I needed to be mobile. I needed something so I wasn't squatting or kneeling all day. I needed a stool. And so if you're going to buy one thing, that's it. Get a stool because you're going to be moving and grooving. And it's amazing. All right. So Rhonda shared, uh, Rhonda's question was, what does this look like for early primary kinders and first grades? I shared a link in the chat already. Uh, Notre 
Notre Dame or Notre Dame University has the uh, has doing some fantastic research. Uh, that was what I shared in the chat. Uh, so look back through the chat with that. Or if you just go to Google and type in blended learning in the early years, uh, the Notre Dame one that they just published about a year ago, I think it's March 19th of 2019, has some fantastic laying out. There's some video of some blended learning classrooms in the primary years. They've done some really good research around that. So be looking for that. All right. Uh, Claire asks, best ways to teach students how to be self-paced independent learners. We provide them a pacing guide and then what? Google Calendar. Like mm -hmm. start there, man. Like I, I, I created a classroom calendar that I shared with all of my kids and I put the assignments on there as calendar events. That way they could check my calendar and those are my due dates, right? So I had a hard schedule of this is when you should be done. Now, if they turned it in after that, they weren't losing late points because I'm not gonna penalize a kid for taking longer to learn a concept, right? But it was a way for them to track their own schedule. And I expected them and taught them. That's the key. Kids don't know how to use calendar. Kids don't know how to manage Agreed. their own time, you know? So teach them how to populate their own calendar. Forget I just said that. Teach them, show them why it is important to populate their own calendar. Because if you just tell them to use a calendar, they're not going to do it. But if you create the need and you show them the benefit of scheduling their time on Google Calendar, that's the key. Start with calendar. Yeah, I like that. This is a good question. I like this one. How does it work for a multi-age, 11 through 17-year-olds, multi-grade, 5th through 12th grade, multi-level, third grade skill to college skill classroom? because we're so experienced with that. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> climb that mountain, baby. That's yeah. what I'm talking All about. right, let's tag team this one as a group of three. Ooh. So, you know, I don't know, but I don't know why. When you started reading that, I was like, that would be cool to give it a go. I know. Wouldn't mm -hmm. this? I mean, I was like, it would be cool to give it a go because so, really, if, if you come up with a highly structured type of scenario around a topic, they easily can choose and you have different, like uh, the calendar pieces that Stefan was just talking about of like checkpoints okay, and checkpoint pieces that are there um, to be able to get done. I sort of, I, I feel like it could naturally, you could come up with some really cool things or even the collaboration. This is something that I didn't get yeah. to share in our, in our ideas, the collaboration of the 17 year olds with the 12 year olds. Oh my gosh, what a powerful experience for the 12 year olds and the 17 year olds. So my AP seniors have done blogging connections with our eighth grade middle school EMS students and the EMS students were told that they were going to write blogs about a concept that was a government concept and that the senior AP students were going to read their blogs and our eighth grade teacher JB Blair who, who Jeff knows who's awesome said that they just freaked out like oh my gosh the seniors are going to be reading my blogs like I can't they can't have them so he had to talk them down from that but then it became this increased I guess effort if you will and focus to write a good blog because the senior was going to watch it different than if they were just writing it for Mr. Blair and then my students, the aha moment for me with this is I was talking to them about how they can provide productive response in an online environment to an eighth grader who's kind of fragile emotionally. And you don't necessarily want to, because I told them they're scared. You want to make sure you further the discussion, but make sure that you don't like belittle them or make them feel bad about it. So the conversation in my room on the back end behind of, of students going, all right, you were, they were assigned this particular person's blog and they're like, I don't know how to say this. And they started talking to their classmates about how can I say this in a way that encourages them? How can I say that moment for me was like, yeah. I can't even quantify how powerful yeah. that was for them. And yeah. the, the eighth graders, besides the fact that the eighth graders, I teach a freshman AP class, these eighth graders got a chance to come up and watch us do a Socratic seminar. And they got a chance to see how our AP level high school classes were run they now leading into high school have some kind of connection about what that's, it was, it was powerful. It was really powerful. Yeah. And this is the problem. Like you and I, I think are both, you know, I, I read something like this from Lewis and I'm just, my problem is, is I don't know how to not teach. If I was in that, I would be so excited in that classroom, but I don't know how to not teach blended learning in that classroom. Like I would just instantly go to, well, this has to be a, I mean, it's a blended class, 13 through 17 year olds, different, like you would, I would take a blended learning approach because it actually fits a blended learning type of classroom. So I love your answer. That's a, that's a perfect example of how you can have kids collaborate uh, across, even in the same classroom. Or how are you setting up those learning structures that are, are taking the, the, what everybody has to offer? And I think that's something we need to think about a lot in education. That I, I, I've just been, this somebody, and I don't remember where I got it from, but somebody made this point that, you know, when you go to business or when you get a job, 
or just in life, right? You become part of a team. Nobody makes you part of a team and says, hey, Steve, I know that you're really good at organizing things. I know you're a type one organizer. I know that's what you're really good at. You're not going to do that. You're going to go and do this other thing. That never happens in teams. But we do that all the time in education. Instead of running towards kids' strengths, we try to figure out how to make them well-rounded. And neuroscience will tell you, after about the age of six or seven, we've got to just play on the strength of that brain, right? And so how do we, and I would even say like this, if I have a multi-age classroom, what is the strength that every child brings? What is, what's the strength an 11-year-old 11, uh, 11 has and the strength that the 17-year-old has, and how do they fit together to build a team? And you work in your strength. Right? You work in your strength. My strength is not organization. That's why I surround myself with type A people all the time, right? I'm not an organized person. I'm an ideas guy. Somebody else needs to do the organization. And I can't be bothered with that part. Right? But, we, but in the real world, in the real world, outside of classrooms, we always lean towards our strengths. So know the strengths of your kids and embrace that. Embrace that and use that as, as we move forward. So I think that's just something to be thinking about uh, as we go through. Um, a couple of the things here. Oh, there's one that they, poor Sylvia has been trying to get me to understand uh, what she wanted. She wants, she wants uh, Stefan to repeat. She said, okay, so Sylvia has been waiting all day for this. She said, during when you were going back on that number three, uh, Stefan, you said something about, he said some, he said some kids will write jokes. What is going on at home? It was something of the effect of, is there anything you want to tell me or want me to know? What, yeah. was you, what was that whole thing about, Stefan? Sorry. Uh, and I can show you real quick. Um, it, actually, it might take me a longer time to pull it up than I, than I should. But all I did is if my kids are self-paced, right, who is responsible of holding them accountable for their learning? It's me, right? And so kids don't – kids control the pace, but, like, I need to be holding them accountable. And one of the ways that I did that was I built in, again, consistency, right? I built in consistent reflections – periodically throughout the lesson, but always at the end of the lesson, always. So a kid knew they were going to fill out a reflection in the same place. And I used that for a bunch of different things, right? But the very last question, it was the only one that was optional. The very last question at the end of every single reflection was simply, is there anything you need to tell me? Sometimes kids skip it. Sometimes kids, and, and this, nothing made me prouder than when a kid would tell me a, a funny joke or make fun of me, right? Because that's the culture of my classroom. Uh, Tyler Rablin in one of our sessions earlier said, culture is built in 30 second bursts. And I love that because you don't just build culture on one day and then move on and hope your culture is sustained, right? You're always building culture. And so every now and then I change it up. Tell me a hobby of yours, what's going on at home, whatever. But it was, you know, I always had that is there anything you need to tell me? And so that was this open format. Some kids are not comfortable coming up to me in, in front of class to ask a question. Uh, but that I would say every now and then in that, is this working for you? Give me feedback in that last question, right? But very, very, very simple. It's just one question on a Google form. And it was insanely powerful. And honestly, I actually changed it halfway through the year from, do you have any questions or concerns? Two, is there anything you need to tell me? Almost on a whim. Like I kind of even didn't really, I was like, yeah, I could just change this up and finish the wording. And I got a lot more from that because yeah, it means something different to kids. Yes, that open-ended yeah. question. And again, the, the whole title, not to maybe wrap it up here right at 5.30, but with, or, with and without walls, <laughs> right? It just comes up, it's coming up all the time is you, we, all, we all know, or at least hopefully all have experienced it. And I'm not perfect at it. There's times in class to get frustrated when the students maybe not behave in the way that they're supposed to or want to and approach it in a way that becomes more confrontational. But every time I've ever approached that student and said, hey, are you okay? Is there anything I need to know? It's always been a good productive discussion. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the without walls way of being able to do it in an online environment with a question like that or a Google form like that. All right, we have just a couple more questions and then we're done for the day. So here's, here's the first one. I think this one's gonna be pretty easy for us to answer. I like this one though. Maria asks, in a normal time, we'd be encouraging staff to start small. We are trying to push ourselves to really lean on technology this fall to be consistent for our families, regardless of whether or not we are in school. Our staff needs support, a lot of it. If we have to really focus on a few major ideas to implement blended learning, what would you suggest all staff focus on? 
I know where I go immediately and I don't know the question or the question's coming from if they're Google or Microsoft or whatever, but it's a similar type of scenario is I'd go to a shared Google doc. And if you're part of what we're doing, I would go to the, you know, the, like the silent, the silent social reading types of activities. That is a simple way for you to really start to expand how you're going to go beyond it. That'll provide feedback, it provides collaboration. It provides all of those areas that really doesn't take a whole lot to get comfortable with and get your mind wrapped around that will lead to, and what it did for me is it led to, oh, I could do this next thing this way. I could do the next thing this way. And you almost naturally go, like Stefan said, into your own, what, what is unique to you, what is the way that works for you, rather than just trying to do what other people do. So if you were trying to, um, trying to get yourself to that particular point, that, that's the simple places that I would start. Yeah. And, and I would just, I would add to that. Uh, for me, I would just say your core four. And, and I, we have some people here who haven't gone through our trainings, and, and that is what our trainings at Reimagine Why Ed are all about, is that core four. Um, and there is, there is a lot of things out there, but focus in on those core four. If you need to focus on one or two things, know how to use a dynamic document, which is what uh, Steve is talking about. A dynamic document is Google Docs or Word Online, not Word on your computer where you can't share it with anybody. Dynamic documents are documents that can be shared with multiple different people at the same time. And that would be something that I would wanna make sure that all my staff know how to do. With that would also be slides. You'll notice that the things that we've been sharing in the chat, chat a lot of them are slideshows because those are how you create pathways. They are simple pathways that teachers can create that instruction around. And again, do it in a dynamic document, something like Google Slides or something like uh, PowerPoint Online. Uh, Christy was asking in the chat, what is silent social reading? Uh, I'll have to see if there's a video. I don't know if I have any videos of it. It's something that you do with your class where everybody gets to leave comments on an article inside something like a Google Doc or Word online. It's very powerful. Uh, email me and I'll be able to walk you through it a lot easier than here as well. So. Can I, Jeff, I know that we're late on time, but I do have the one example that I didn't show could kind of show that a little bit, although it's not a doc. I'll, I'll just share it real quick. Is that all right? Yep. yep. If, if we do that. That'd be the last so, thing we do. Then we'll be out of here. Okay. Well, Basically what it is, um, if, da, 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 there we go, I'm gonna pull it up. I'll, I'm gonna give a little preview to it first of all. So basically what it is, is you take an, a, a Google document or whatever your dynamic document is, and it could be an article, it could be something that you're reading, okay? and as they're reading it, they're just adding comments in the right-hand side okay, to be able to interact with it. In classroom, within the walls, I used to call it active reading or annotated reading, right? So they would read, they'd take a highlighter, they'd write questions in the margins. It's the online version of that, right, of what you could do. Real quickly, during my civil rights movement, I've always created a civil rights movement book. And so what I did is I had students choose a topic, they printed out a page, okay, and that page that would get, came to me, I would then make hard copies of 25 different packets on the copy machine, right, that they would go through and they would highlight and they'd annotate. I've shifted that now to just something that we can do online. Okay, there's an example of, a, of the silent social reading that we've done, okay, of being able to have an interactive document that is there. Stefan, can you pull up the, the- Yeah, it's up there right now. The booklet. The, the Civil Rights oh, Movement. Never mind. I got it. I'll, I'll share my screen. I'll share my screen. So yeah. this did is I the booklet. Did not share my screen? Oh. You, you did, but I'll share mine. Oh, this okay. is the booklet here. <laughs> that was me. I shared my screen. Oh, you did. This is the booklet here. And so this page right here, okay, if I click on present, okay, is basically the, the form that's put together. It's not perfectly formatted and everything else, but this was the Brown versus Board of Education type of topic. But what we do is I then send it out to them and I have students add comments to those particular pages of what they're witnessing and what they're seeing. So this is an e-booklet portion of things and how it's set up and how it's put together. And this would be an example, the commenting portion of things would be an example of a silent social reading, but it's they're reading what their classmates have produced, right? And they're commenting on that, so. Cool. So one of the last things I want to uh, show and see if I can find it here. I don't know where it's at. And uh, give me just one sec. I don't have it here. I'll have to find it here in just a second. Um, but we're being asked um, about how, how would you do this in large classes like band, choir, or PE? And I think the first thing I would say is uh, video, video, video. <laughs> uh, PE especially, I've seen so many great ways that, P that video has been used in PE. 
Uh, I've seen great ways that video has been used uh, in band. Um, I will show you this real quick if you want to see kind of a cool band ag activity or music activity for music class. Uh, let me share my screen real quick here for you. If you want to stick around for this band example, I won't play the whole thing, but I think this is an interesting example of that a kid using well. technology. I started out halfway music. through the year, unlike everybody else, my project is only mediocrely complete. I started out thinking I was actually going to train my two-year-old dog Pippin for once, but he's a hopeless ball of fluff with all fur and no brain, so I gave up quickly. Soon enough, a great inspiration struck when I found myself, for no reason at all, browsing a composing website called Flat.io. All the cards aligned, and I was ready to put my project into action. I've been playing clarinet since fourth grade and tenor for two years, as well as alto sax for one. I decided on keeping the piece an entirely B flat key for the time being, because that is what I'm most comfortable with, and I haven't tried anything quite like this before. I started off with two instruments, a trumpet and a clarinet. Not a common duet, mind you, but easy enough to combine. The whole shebang was a lot of me writing for multiple hours and then going back and deleting the majority of what I had written because it just wasn't good enough. I was really fortunate because the first website that I used was actually perfect. Flatio is like a really good website. So yeah, you should go check it out. It's super cool. Throughout the song, I wrote both parts simultaneously. Not that the trumpet part was... So I'll stop that there. But the thing I love and the reason why I show that is this is a, this is a, a student who is in band. Uh, also happens to be my goddaughter and I'm so proud of her. And my favorite part is, is that video wasn't even about band. Actually, her band teacher had her write a five paragraph essay instead of making a video like that. And she made it specifically in a TikTok video fashion because she wanted that style. So she's thinking of style, not only in the music that she created and the background music was the piece of music she created, but she's thinking through all, I mean, and if you, if you were a band teacher, I would hope that it would blow your mind if you could watch the entire video. In fact, I'll put it in the, the chat if you want to go watch it at your own. Um, to listen to this student who, again, did this for English class, but thinking about what that might look like, right? That when we're talking about big classes like band, choir, and PE, video, 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 video feedback, whether kids are playing an instrument and listening to themselves, whether kids are playing multiple different instruments and making music together. There's ways to do this in classes like that, where maybe you have two sections of a band uh, make something together. So just know that there are ways to do it. Um, and, and kids are doing this already. It's just how do we harness it? Uh, and what I would say is it, that is student culture. How are we moving towards student culture? So, all right, guys. Well, thank you so much. We've kept everybody here long enough. You still got 80 people holding on strong. Short, sweet, uh, so, and to the point, right, guys? Uh, <laughs> I like it. So thank you, everyone, for sticking around with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, Steve just put his email there. It's steve at shiftingschools.com. Stephens is stephen at shiftingschools.com. Uh, and you can reach out to me at jeff at shiftingschools.com if you like as well. Uh, really appreciate it. All of this will be on YouTube. You will be able to watch it all on YouTube. And it will be on the resource page at the reimagine why ed.com website. Uh, give us about 24 hours. The chat will be there. The presentation will be there and the video will be there as well. So thanks everyone. Appreciate it. Have a great night. This closes Stefan and Steve. Thursdays with Stefan and Steve. <laughs>